start. Okay. Well, hello and good afternoon, everyone. Our thanks to all of you for joining us today. My name is Anthony Fierro, and I'm the Executive Director of Facility Services for NASA Oboses. Uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, or if you are outside of the New York area, uh, BOCES stands for the Board of Cooperative <clears throat> Educational Services. NASA BOCES is a local educational agency located here on Long Island, and we provide shared educational programs and services to the 56 school districts in Nassau County. So today we're excited to present the final installment of a three-part webinar series focusing on school planning and design for COVID-19. Today's webinar is hosted by Nassau BOCES and the Long Island chapter of the American Institute of Architects, and it's titled Transforming School Design for a Post-COVID World, Learning Spaces for Creativity and Collaboration. And as I've mentioned at our previous webinars, the primary goal of this series is to provide a forum for design professionals and the educational community to collectively examine the physical school environment that we're currently providing for our students, uh, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, today, together, we want to explore the emerging, emerging trends in this evolving field of school design and develop new strategies that will enhance learning. So to address these goals, we've brought together some exceptional presenters over the course of the webinar series. And today is no different. Uh, today's two speakers have extensive experience in school planning and design, and they have lectured all over the world. Uh, the session is interactive, so we encourage everyone to please participate in the discussion. And uh, so before we begin the presentation, I would like to invite Dr. Robert Dillon, our district superintendent for Nassau BOCES, to say a few words. Dr. Dillon. Thank you, Tony. I really appreciate that. And I want to thank you, Tony, uh, your staff and, and our partners, the architects from Long Island for this particular uh, webinar series. Uh, it's, it was very difficult to pull off given the circumstances, but I really appreciate the effort you guys have put together. I'd also like to thank and acknowledge our Board of Education who supports uh, our, our interests and our initiatives as we move forward. And this was certainly quite the undertaking and given the fact that in March, we, the world was turned upside down, this, this came off uh, really well. You know, today, uh, the final leg, the final uh, journey of our three-legged journey, our three-legged stool, uh, we're gonna talk about some COVID issues and it's, you know, it's on everyone's issue, uh, everyone's top issue today. You know, today uh, we had nine schools uh, close in, in Nassau County just today because of COVID related uh, results. In addition, today you're gonna to hear about the social emotional learning, which I think is very important because um, you know, one of my colleagues said a year ago, if we don't have social emotional learning in our classrooms, we really have nothing. To, it's the foundation that everything else is, is built on. So in closing, I'd like to again, thank our participants. Uh, they're from all over, uh, some international today and some down in warmer weathers, but I, I, I thank them for their participation in, in being here today. And I also, like I said, Tony and his staff and, and the architects from Long Island and the DC area. Thanks again and have a great webinar. Be well. Thank you, Dr. Dillon. Uh, next, I'll turn the program over to Graciela Carrillo, president of the Long Island chapter of the American Institute of Architects uh, to introduce our two speakers who are joining us today from Florida and from Israel. So Graciela. Thank you, Tony. I'm very happy to collaborate with NASA BOSIS on putting together this important event for educators, architects, engineers, and everybody, every, everyone that is involved in the planning and design of schools. Now, let me introduce you to our speakers. Prakash Nair, AIA, is a futurist and visionary architect and the founding president and CEO of Education Design International, EDI. Prakash established EDI as an umbrella organization that brings together the best school architecture with research-driven innovations in a number of other industry industries, including education, environmental science, neurology, psychology, and child development. Companies established by Prakash have done consultations in 52 countries on six continents. He is the recipient of many international awards, including the A4LE McConnell Award, the highest honor worldwide for school design. 
He has written extensively in leading international journals about school design. He is the author of three books, including the new landmark publication, Learning by Design, Live, Play, Engage, Create. The language of school design now is in its third edition. And Blueprint for Tomorrow, Redesigning School for Student-Centered Learning, and it was published by Harvard Education Press. Prakash serves as an instructor for the EDX Leaders of Learning, MOOC, led by Harvard's Dr. Richard Elmore. Uh, this course has over 220,000 registrants worldwide. Prior to co-founding Education Design International, Prakash worked for 10 years as the Director of Operations for a multi-million dollar school construction program for New York City, the largest school construction program in the world. And our second speaker today is Romer Simmer Doctori. She is a principal architect at Education Design International. She has over 17 years of professional architectural and project management experience. And before joining EDI, she served as an architect and design team leader at Aleph Bet Planners in Israel. She is a co-author of the new and highly acclaimed book on school design, learning by design, live, play, engage, create. And she has lectured, conducted workshops, presented keynote conference talks, and delivered a full day masterclass on school design in different parts of the world, including Australia and Canada. Her portfolio of educational work includes various schools around the world. For the past three years, Ronnie has collaborated on innovative educational projects, including the nationally renowned Goya Teacher Training Academy developed by the AMIT Network of Schools. During this time, she has worked on projects in Australia, Canada, India, Israel, Romania, Singapore, many other countries, <laughs> and of course, the United States. Uh, after the presentations by Prakash and Rani, we will have some time to respond to questions. Please use the Q and X, uh, the Q and A box that you have at the lower side of your screen. Uh, if we run out of time and we have a few questions that we cannot address, we will be addressing them uh, past the webinar. And then this will be published online on, on NASA BOSIS website and as well as uh, AIA Long Island chapter uh, websites. Uh, welcome Prakash and Ronnie, and thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you again, uh, Graciela. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Dr. Dillon. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to be here. In some ways, I'm kind of coming back home <laughs> a little bit because I uh, started my professional career in, in New York City. So I'll just uh, put up the presentation first and then we'll start, we'll start from there. So uh, Graciela gave a long-winded explanation for who we are, so I'm not going to dwell any further on that other than to say that I said that I started my professional career in New York City. Uh, I was the director of operations for school construction and everything that you're seeing here is in a way a redemption for the, for the period of uh, time I worked in New York City because we built uh, beautiful award-winning schools, but the problem is that they were obsolete on the day they opened. They were really all old paradigm schools. And uh, as soon as I realized that, and it took me 10 years before I figured that out, I left um, hoping that uh, there'd be a market for a different kind of school. And fortunately there has been because there's a hunger for a different way to educate our kids. And the school building really is the most uh, visible evidence of what we think about education and children. So with that, um, I'm going to begin. And my partner, Roni, has had a detailed introduction from Graciela, so I don't need to say anything more other than that it's a pleasure to have her here with me because uh, we've been working together in a number of countries and have done this um, these kinds of workshops together quite a bit now, so. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. So I think uh, Graciela sent you this link. If not, I'm just going to give you a few seconds to uh, 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 to sign in here because uh, I'd love to get, uh, both of us would love to get your feedback on some questions that we have for you. And then it'll also become an opportunity for us to have a further discussion about that. So just leave it up uh, for a couple of, couple more minutes here, or not minutes, a few more seconds. <laughs> So you can open this, by the way, on on a, on a phone or another device if you don't want to um, uh, do it on your regular the computer that you're using. And if you do, you can just minimize your Zoom, uh, join here, quickly answer a question, and then reopen your Zoom window. 
So either way is fine with us. The survey results themselves should actually show up within the, uh, within the PowerPoint itself that I'm presenting. Graciela just shared the, the link on the chat on the chat box. So I think you can move on to the first yeah. survey question and people can just. Okay, yeah, you can just in. look at the chat box. Okay, great. So since we are there, let's look at the survey question one. And the question one was, how uh, badly has the COVID crisis hurt most children's education? I'm curious to see, I think what you think, so. So anyway, as this is coming in, I think the, the results, <laughs> we don't have to wait for the end of the poll to kind of get a sense of where people are here. So most people are saying that it's um, hurt children's education very badly and some say somewhat badly. So between those two categories, we pretty much have almost 100%. Uh, some people say not at all. So Roni, what, is, what, do you what do you take? Uh, what's your take on this, uh, these results? What do you think? I'm curious about the 3%. Is it because of what they think of schools? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting because it, the, there are two ways of looking at it. I mean, it's quite clear that the children who definitely desperately need to be in school are very badly hurt. And I'm talking about children who uh, get the free lunches at school or children who come from homes that are not the happiest places to be or people who don't have uh, internet broadband, internet access at home. There are those uh, and they definitely um, are not doing as well being out of school. But the reality is that we're talking about education and what we are saying is that the physical school, which is what they're missing right now, represents an old paradigm. And that's what we're gonna get into. So while it is true that most children don't have the routine of being in a, in a physical place, I think that we, Roni and I might take exception to the idea that their education is being badly hurt. We don't know that. Um, we'll know that 10 years from now when the results are in about how this one year truly affected kids. And as I said, I'm excluding the children who desperately need to be in school for a variety of social and emotional reasons. So with that, actually, I'm going to move on. We can stop uh, uh, with the survey. And there's another question I want to ask while I'm there. And I'm, I'm going to ask a second question, which is, how name one education life skill that education, essential life skill that education should prepare students for, so. <clears throat> wow, communication jump to the top. Thinking, critical thinking, I think it should yeah, be. Yeah, critical thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. And right. Kindness. Yeah. I also want to look at the not so common terms that pop up sometimes. So while we are on the subject, let's think, let's talk about critical thinking because it is really one of the top three skills that students need for, for success in today's world. Uh, the other two would be problem solving and creativity. Uh, so- uh, And also it, cognitive flexibility, which I think yeah, is kind flexibility. of, yeah. yeah. The able, ability to adapt to different paradigms as, as the yeah. world changes, how quickly can we adapt to that? So adaptability would be one. So patience, so, yeah, th these, <laughs> all of these are obviously important. So anything here that, um, Catches your eye, Roni? Um, I see flexibility and resilience and um, confidence is very, very important, actually. It has yeah. a lot to do with what we're going to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. And I also see the emotional, social, uh, social, uh, social emotional mm -hmm. um, aspects, which are now, I think, are very um, yep. missing from, right. you know, from the distant learning. 
Yeah, and don't forget grit. Uh, there's research that shows that it's probably the number one most important quality. So it's not as much as how much we think we know, but how persistent we are and how determined we are to succeed. And so that's another important thing. And again, the question comes to what extent are schools um, doing this in a, giving students an opportunity to demonstrate these, these, uh, these skills and competencies. Okay, so let's keep moving. So Prakash, in spite of all the problems, uh, schools and universities continue to educate hundreds and uh, hundreds of millions of people all around the world. And beyond COVID, I wanna ask you, what is so different today to imagine that education needs such a revolutionary change? Well, I think uh, when we talk about education and revolutionary change, that the revolution is already happening. We're right now in the thick of what we call the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, led by artificial intelligence, which by itself is going to change uh, multiple industries all around the world. I was just talking recently about how our books, which used to be printed in a more traditional way, uh, are now being printed directly by Amazon on demand. So essentially, it, it completely revolutionized the entire printing industry. You can just send them a PDF file and they'll print the book and ship it. By the way, this is printed all over the world. So if someone wants to buy my book in Australia, it, they, it can be printed there. So it changes everything. That's because of artificial intelligence. So all of these um, technologies are evolving exponentially, whereas in the past, the, in other revolutions happened more incrementally. And so the idea that schools, which ultimately are preparing children for the future, if you, if you think about any futuristic enterprise, schools should be at the top of that list, because after all, uh, we are, they are the ones preparing students for the future, right? So they, it makes sense that uh, they should be schools should be leading the charge when it comes to this, and so that's one reason why I believe that uh, it's absolutely critical that we be thinking about a different and new paradigm for education. The second is that, and this is kind of tied anyway, is that schools um, are tied into a very hierarchical network, which is based on the older model, uh, whereas the the new model is a, an open network and uh, where people and resources are accessible um, on on demand, so to speak, and so that's a big uh, change. So we understand the need of a network-based model, but don't we have this already? I mean, don't uh, children already use the internet to learn? Well, that's true. Having the internet in and of itself is not what I'm, I'm, what I'm talking about. Basically what it is is that, uh, and this is in our course, uh, Leaders of Learning, uh, which is actually available as a MOOC and it's free. It's a Harvard course that I'm, I'm doing the, the facilities piece of it. But basically what we are saying is there are four uh, uh, quadrants. And schools belong naturally to one of these quadrants. Now, it doesn't mean that there's not a mix and match, but heavily one or other quadrant is what a school fundamentally believes in. So let's look at the hierarchical individual model. Hierarchy simply means that somebody above the student is telling that student what to do, how to do, when to do it. And so the individual student is now at the mercy, if you will, of the hierarchy. And the, every individual student must accomplish certain milestones at certain ages in order to satisfy the requirements of the hierarchy. So basically that's what the hierarchical individual model is, whether it's the curriculum, whether it's the assessments and on and on, at every grade you are expected to complete certain requirements. That's a model of uh, the education that we are all familiar with. In fact, almost all of us went through a hierarchical individual model of learning. The hierarchical collective basically says, yes, we recognize the value of uh, the, the hierarchy, meaning that you children are not competent enough to, to know what to learn. So we will tell you, okay? So we are there to help you. But the reason is not just for you to self-actualize. The reason is also for you to improve the world, make the world a better place. In, in, in the Jewish world, something called tikkun ulam, make the world better, right? So I, th there's a purpose to education that goes beyond the individual. It's also about improving the community, but it's still a hierarchy telling you what to do. The distributed individual model, on the other hand, recognizes that today's world is a very, very different world. Whereas the teacher was the font of all knowledge in the old days, today, uh, knowledge and information is freely available. So the job of the school is not necessarily to be the source of all information, but rather the gateway to a world of information and allow students to uh, thrive and take advantage of the amazing resources that are available out there. So the resources are distributed and individuals can then uh, take advantage of that. And the school basically becomes the agent for that. 
The last model is called the distributed collective. And here, basically, the lines between teacher and student are blurred. Basically, the people come together in groups to achieve uh, common goals. So it could be anything as from a, from a book club uh, to building some uh, a new IMCA, whatever it might be. This is common goals driving people, and everybody contributes, but everybody also learns. So that's that's the distributed uh, collective model. So these four models of uh, of education are available. The question for all of you is this: uh, for post COVID, what should be the dominant uh, model of uh, learning theory in schools. Do you feel like things need to change? And if so, what should they be? Um, Prakash, while we're waiting for people to take the survey, uh, they've been asking if you could repeat the uh, MOOC of you and Dr. Oh Amar. yeah, it's, uh, it's called Leaders of Learning. And you can just Google it, Leaders of Learning, Harvard, M-O-O-C. Harvard edX, E-D-X. As I said, it's free and you get a certificate from Harvard, you have to think if you pay $99. <laughs> I think we have around 220,000 registrants already. Speaking of an open network model. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> and it really forces us to think about our own philosophy and, and realize that whether we want to or not, we all have our own uh, internal uh, models of what we think education should be. So it's very interesting that this group is tending to pick um, the distributed collective, which is a very radical departure from where we are. And, and, and here the distributed collective basically says that you put a group of people together with common interests and they will educate each other. And in fact, interestingly enough, there is such a model, it's called Tutoria in, uh, in Mexico, which have no schools. They don't have any physical school buildings. They essentially put uh, students in connection with other students and they essentially tutor each other and that's the distributed collective model but in the united states we're very far cry from from that um you know but distributed collective actually happens in schools due, after school in the clubs in all the different clubs in the chess clubs and the you know reading clubs and uh, all the other stuff even the sports teams and all that that's very much distributed collective so so yeah it's just interesting that um this is breakdown, but this group that we're talking to looks like a pretty radical group <laughs> from, what, from, from what I see here, you know? They just, they don't want to just change the system, they want to blow it up, you know, but- Try, you know, that, try to put it so it sounds like a compliment. <laughs> yeah, it is a compliment, yeah, 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 it is actually. But the reality is that we can, in fact, uh, what we're going to be talking about is uh, improving what we have and yet making it feel like a revolution, even though uh, we don't have to throw away everything, you know? So that's not what we're talking about at all. So um, I guess, uh, so the question Roni for you, since I have been answering all these questions is, in this context that we're talking about, we have to define learning. So what do you think learning is and how do we, uh, you know, is there a definition of learning that we should be aware of when we're talking about all of this stuff? Okay, so when we talk about learning, um, first we need to keep in mind that teaching and learning are not the same thing. And then there are two basic models for learning. There is the teacher-centered model and the student-centered model. Next. So the teacher-centered model is basically um, putting the focus on the teacher. The teacher is, uh, is leading the um, learning. The teacher has uh, the knowledge and the teacher is in charge of what's going on in class at all times. So it's all based about the teacher and the teacher needs, um, and mostly also the need to control the students so, so effective learning can happen in class. Next. And then the second model would be the student-centered model uh, that puts the students, the student in the center, meaning that it's all about the student and we want the student to be in charge of learning. We want the student to do active learning. And it's all about the student and not the teacher. The teacher is only on the um, guidelines, only helping the students to, uh, um, to learn. Uh, please move on. So um, we can see that the teacher-centered uh, lear uh, learning is a very old model. Of course, this uh, picture demonstrates that the, this model hasn't changed in many, many years, actually around 150 years. And next. And that's an example for a student-centered learning, but it can also, if you put, um, if you pay attention to the title, it can also be a good example for student-directed learning, meaning 
uh, we don't know if the teacher is the one who told each and every student what they should be engaged with, what they should be doing, or is it part of their own choice? Uh, but we definitely do not need um, adults to tell uh, children how to learn. Please move on. Um, so the student-centered learning uh, is based on four principles. The first one is kind of self-speaking, personalized learning, but it's very hard to do when there's one teacher with a group of students locked in the room that we're calling classroom. The second one is a competency-based education and simply means that we want the students, all students, to master whatever it is they learn before the class moves on. Anytime, anywhere learning, um, again, it's not just about school. Learning happens anytime, anywhere, and we need to acknowledge that. And student-earned learning is simply um, uh, about partnership, about acknowledging that students have a voice, they have agency, they need to have agency, and we need to see them as partners, not just um, taking instructions. Next. Um, Learning by Design, our latest book, um, is all about um, actually the natural learning because we all are born with natural curiosity. We all learn from the day we are born. And what we're saying is learning is byproduct. It's a byproduct of life. Everything you do on your daily, on your everyday life is, is learning. Uh, it's a byproduct of play, which is a very natural way for kids to learn and uh, engage if the, if the uh, children or any, any of us, if we're engaged with what we're doing, then we learn. And of course, create, which is the uh, maybe highest result of the learning process. Um, so basically what we're saying is we would like to uh, put the focus less about teaching and more about learning. The more the teacher is teaching, the students are actually learning by themselves and, and doing what they're supposed to do, giving um, um, being given an opportunity to express their, um, their own interest and their own curiosity. Next. So how does this translate to learning spaces? Uh, we talked about learning. So what does that mean for learning spaces? So that's the typical uh, school that we are uh, calling cells and bells because they all by the way, look the same in Israel as well. The school I went to looks uh, more or less as this picture. The students and the teachers are walking into a cell, which we call a classroom in the morning, and then the bell goes off and they move from one cell to another identical cell. And they're doing, uh, most of the time, they're doing the same thing uh, because most of the of teaching, most of practices is um, um, frontal teaching and that's what the, these cells allow. Move on. So that's the um, typical classroom and we can see who's in charge here next. And this looks slightly better because we have big windows that bring in daylight and you can see that not all students are sitting in rows and some of them are sitting in group, but, but it's still uh, very limiting the options. Next. And again, it's a very, very old model. Actually, I think it began at 18, around 1875 uh, in the industrial uh, era when students had to be taught how to do repeatedly um, um, action over and over again and how to follow orders. And it's no longer what we need them to practice as um, preparation for the future. Next. So with that, let's go to the fourth survey question, which is, we are going to show you a few learning spaces and I'm going to activate this. We want you to pick the one that you like the best. Maybe you like them all. No results coming in means that the that it's a question everybody has to give it a, a longer thought, thought to, to. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully that's the reason that's not because the survey itself isn't working let's make sure it, either that or the pictures are too small i think you can you can no no, no on the on the thing you should be able to no yeah. i'm just waiting for it says waiting for it to be deactivated oh yeah it's coming up okay it should show up i'll, I'll pick one and see if it works graciela give us a sign if there's a problem with the survey no, I already completed mine. Yeah, but it's I'm so saying why perfect. is it not showing up here? Let me see, let me minimize it and then put it back. Uh, 
Yeah, on the website it looks perfect. The four images. Yeah. Okay. okay don't tell. Don't tell us what you picked. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Let, let me let me put it up. There. It'll re, it'll it'll refresh when I put it up. Well, let's try. Should refresh. Oh, okay, I don't know why it's not not refreshing because it should have but, refreshed up here. But if you just uh, oh, you know what? Let me do. Let me do one thing here. Um, if you're just not on presentation mode, it is refreshing. So. Yeah, this is not refreshing. It's okay. But anyway, so let's quickly talk about this. Um, I'm curious though, what people would have actually uh, show responses. Prakash, if you just um, oh yeah, now it's showing. Yeah. Okay, now it's showing. Okay. okay, see, so people have been picking um, number C, fifty-five percent. So there's a significant. Uh, um, I mean, there's there's clearly a winner here, you know. Yes. And that space, the number three space. Let's talk a little bit about it. In fact, I'm going to be talking about it as part of this presentation, so I won't discuss it too much. But the bottom line is that number A is really the traditional classroom in a way, but a nicer version of it. Uh, number B is actually a pretty good learning space. It's actually it's completely self-directed. It's more like the distributed uh, collective model where students are essentially entirely self-reliant. It's actually a student center at a high school that we design. And uh, D is the a, a sort of a autonomy given given to children at a very early age, the kindergarten stage. Anyway, so let's let's move on. But it's clear that C is important, and I'll talk a little bit more about that during. Prakash, I think the uh, maybe most significant thing about C is that we can see several things happening exactly uh, at the same space on the same time. Meaning right. not all children should do the same thing at the same time at the same yeah. place. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So elements of change. Yeah, that's my question for you. Yeah. So I'd like to ask you, um, are there any universal design principles that you can recommend for school designers? Yeah, sure. There are four basic uh, elements that done. This is in the book, um, Blueprint for Tomorrow. And essentially what I say there is that if you think about universal, certainly I think everybody wants schools to feel welcoming. And so that's, uh, and so what does welcoming mean? It means safe, it means nurturing. And without that uh, basic necessity having been met, you are not going to be a great learner. So that's almost a given. The second is that it has to be versatile, meaning that it has to be personalized and agile uh, and that all students don't feel uh, they can, that, they, that every space is right. Like some, some um, like if you take college students, some of them learn better in a Starbucks and some of them need to retreat to their dorm room to learn. So not everybody's the same. So that's what I talk about agility. And multiple learning modalities means that there are many, many different ways in which we learn as human beings. And the more of those modalities that a school will permit, the more rich the curriculum can be. And finally, the school can send up messages. So for example, uh, hallways send negative messages. I mean, uh, most of the social pathologies in schools, particularly urban schools happen in hallways. So we want to get rid of those kinds of places and, uh, and replace them with more positive uh, environments. So examples, here's a school we designed in Colorado. It's an elementary school, it's a public school, and we created a family room. And so this is clearly a very welcoming entrance. And right behind is the curiosity center. So everybody who comes into school actually sees what students are doing. And the curiosity center is a place where students can figure out what to do. And then all around are places where them, for them to build things. So they can uh, um, not only uh, satisfy the curiosity, they can take it to the next level and create things uh, from that curiosity. Agile means uh, uh, spaces that are not telling you what to do and that you can basically get, get to decide how a space is used so that the architects are kind of stepping back and letting the educators take the lead. Uh, and supporting multiple modalities, the simple version of this is the four modalities that David Thornburg, he calls it the primordial learning met metaphors, which is not probably common knowledge, which I actually put, it out, put this out into the education um, architecture realm. It used to be in the education realm. So essentially campfire is when you learn from an expert and that's usually a classroom type situation. Watering hole is when you're doing the social emotional learning when you're, when you're working with your peers. Cave is when you get time to retreat and internalize, synthesize stuff. And life is when you get to try it all out and see if it works. So a real uh, good school design will enable all four modalities to happen side by side, hand in hand. 
So here's a great example of uh, uh, what positive messages are. So this is a welcoming space, but it also sends messages to students that they are competent and that they can, they can do things on their own and they can do things with others uh, and that you, they don't always need to be told what to do. At the end of this, as you can see a little cafe, they can, they can get refreshments, they can look out at nature, which is, which is very good for them and on and on. So these are just some examples. This is actually at the International School of Brussels. So the new direction. So basically, Roni has an alternative to cells and bells. Obviously, there's a, there's a different way of doing it. That's why we are here. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about, about that. Sure. So the way we look at it is a software and a hardware. If we look on the, off the top of this slide, this is the, the building, which is the hardware. And on the top left, we see the cells and bell model. We see the identical cells in the hallway. And underneath, we see the software. Um, so we can see these four categories or um, four options for, uh, for instance, if we look at the teacher collaboration, then we can see that teachers can only work individually, obviously. They cannot collaborate. They cannot work as a team because everyone is in a different cell. So if we just uh, do one um, little change, slight change here, and we take on the right side, uh, we take off one wall between two classrooms. That already improves the situation because now the teachers can start working as a team. And you can see that the, the, um, uh, the black line is moving from left towards right. So now we have better options. We, can, we have better um, options with pedagogy, with curriculum. Everything started to change and it's, it's a, a really a minor change to do. Next. But if we take it to the next step, then uh, we get to what we call learning community. The learning community is, is kind of the home base um, for, the, for a larger group. And it contains all kinds of spaces. If you want, again, we can use the hardware that allows all kinds of uh, software to run. So we can see the learning suite at the top left. Uh, again, two classrooms that can be divided or can be uh, turn into one. We see a large common area uh, with a, a small group room for a quiet work of a small group or wet and messy if, if uh, we need to do any hands-on work, a media bar, and of course a strong connection to the outdoors. In the middle of all this, we see the teacher collaboration suite that allows the teacher to do their own work while the uh, students are working independently. Um, and of course there's a breakout area and the whole thing uh, is about having all options open and all the resources available. And if you look to the right of the slide, you'll see the software, which now we can now we can run the new software on the hardware because now it allows that those black lines to move towards the right. It doesn't mean that it's the only way to do it. It doesn't mean that the teacher has to work in teams all the time, uh, but now we're, we've given them the option. Next. So this is an example for what a, a community, a learning community can look like. That's actually, um, we're looking at the commons and we can see um, that it's connected to the learning studios. We can see that it's connected to conference room and small group rooms and even to uh, an innovation lab, which uh, is right behind that glass door in the corner. Uh, Prakash, I think this is one of, yeah. of our most famous uh, yeah. yeah, this is a STEAM middle school in Greenville. It's a public school. It won the McConnell Award and, and uh, it was actually done in partnership with uh, uh, Clemson University and BMW. So, okay. <laughs> so we can see that uh, again, students are taking their uh, orders from the teacher, but right after that, they can actually spread. And uh, the space we're looking at used to be two classrooms, but now the wall is open and they have different options. Next. They can sit in groups, they can work independently, they can have the mobi mo mobile technology with them, and they can also look outside on nature. Next. Or um, this is a great example um, from one of our projects in, uh, in India. Um, we always talk about um, multidisciplinary learning, and that's a great um, art space, which also you can see uh, combines music and other things. And Prakash, you were mentioning earlier uh, welcoming spaces. So I think this is a great example for that as well. Next. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'd like to ask you, what is the, um, what, how can we start? 
uh, how can we change, uh, start the change, you know, and what can we do? Yeah, well, I think that uh, the, all the stuff that we're telling you might seem way out there in left field that you say, well, we have a school to run. And I know Dr. Dylan must be saying, uh, yeah, this is great, but I still have a school district to run. So we want to let you know that we wouldn't be in business 20 years from the time we did this uh, with work in public and private sector in rich and poor communities all around the world if what we said wasn't practical. This is the so, number one thing for us, yeah. So the question is, how can we demonstrate for schools that these ideas are actually working? Yeah, okay. So simple answer is that let, let, let's, let's first start with the assumption that we are not talking only about new schools. We can take existing schools and we can, we can do things with them. So for example, I want to show this video of how you can take a cells and bells and convert that into a learning community. And I'll show you actual um, examples uh, of how, where we did this so that you, you can show that it's gonna be done fast, uh, often over the summer. And we start with small scale projects, we call them pathfinders. And then, you know, and then you scale it up across the school. So here, for example, you're getting rid of the old furniture and you're only getting rid of walls that are non-structural walls. And this can actually be done over a summer easily. Uh, some of them we've done in four or five weeks even. So you can see now those classrooms and corridors have become a variety of different spaces, similar to the learning community that Roni was showing you earlier. And you'd still have classroom type spaces called learning studios. You have this big space, which can be a place where the whole group can get together and we call this the learning community. And that, that big space can be reconfigured quite easily from being a, an area for large groups uh, to one where smaller groups uh, can, can work in small uh, teams. Uh, the learning studios, as I said, look a little bit like classrooms, but they don't function like classrooms because they can afford multiple modalities of learning because of the flexibility and the uh, so-called classroom type spaces can now combine to create learning suites where the two teachers can work in harmony. And then when they're not in direct instruction mode, those uh, garage doors open up and the space outside becomes accessible as well. Uh, so here are two specific examples. One is closer to home for you, uh, for those at least uh, the sponsors of this <laughs> talk, which is Horace Greeley High School in Chappaqua, New York, which started, uh, which is actually a very um, highly regarded school. I think at the time we were working, it was in the, in the top few percentile nationally. Uh, but of course, the school looked pretty much um, pretty traditional. This is what it looked like. So we, we, we got three classrooms that kind of look like this. And you can see the hallway and the three classrooms. And we converted it into what we call an iLab, an innovation lab. And this was done a little in, in just a couple of months. So the key to the iLab is the multiple modes of learning. So that students, if they had been trapped in classrooms, could not have engaged in all of these forms of learning. It goes back to the hardware, software, I think that Aroni was talking to you about. So if we don't give you the hardware in which you can conduct 21st century education, you're going to be stuck in the 20th century model, no matter how hard you try. If I gave you a, an Apple IIe computer, you wouldn't be on this webinar, right? It's not possible. So basically to imagine that educators can educate in buildings designed for the 1800s and early 1900s, it makes no sense that uh, that would actually work. So while we have the rhetoric of 21st century education, the school building simply doesn't allow it, don't allow it. So again, if you look at this, the changes were pretty modest. We even left most of the structural walls intact because you know it would have cost a lot to fix the structure. And as you look through these Im uh, images, just take a look at um, the, the, what the kind of teaching and learning going on and how this might compare to the classroom, had the classroom been around. Grouping size would simply not be possible. So I'm just gonna flip through it and then you, you kind of visualize it side by side with the classrooms that existed here before and see if what you're seeing here wouldn't even have been possible under the traditional cells and bells model. So it's the same school, the same students, the same teachers, but with a different uh, model. And Eric Byrne, who was actually the deputy superintendent here at that time, wrote a PhD thesis about this particular uh, uh, renovation and realized that this is all about education. It's not about architecture. The architecture is there to support the new educational paradigm. In fact, Eric is right now the superintendent at Rye uh, uh, Public Schools. And uh, as far as the private school is concerned, some of them are actually far more conservative than the public schools because they have been successful. They have been sending off kids to top Ivy League schools. So this is a very prestigious private school in, uh, in uh, Tampa, not far from where I live. And a uh, hundred year history, I think it was the first uh, all girls school in the state. And basically, 
they were pretty worried about this idea of change because as far as they're concerned, kids are graduating and going on to good colleges, why change? And my, my answer was that because they are succeeding according to the old paradigm, but they're definitely not getting the new skills and competencies that they need to be successful in life. So these were the two computer labs that we changed over a summer. In fact, we use a lot of the internal custodial staff of the school as well. And I won't dwell on it too much other than to say we took out the wall between the two rooms, created a variety of spaces. And interestingly, this was the, uh, this is the case study in which you guys gave a high score to the, that you picked 59% that precisely from here. So essentially what we did is we made it a student-centered space where the teachers act as guides and the students are completely in charge. So here, for example, fifth grade students coming in for the first time, they hadn't even seen the space, completely took over the space because this is the kind of environments in which they live uh, outside of school. So when they come into environments like this, they become super comfortable and the teachers don't even have to guide them. In fact, they figure out all the technology on their own with no help from the teachers whatsoever. So here, this is a picture that you like, and you can see there's a, there's a place for students to relax, but it's actually a whole class can fit in there, believe it or not. And multiple teachers can be in this space. And because of the acoustic uh, treatments that we have, they don't disturb each other. And here's a couple of examples of how a teacher can walk around and look at a, com uh, a computer screen or help a kid without having to uh, sit next to them. And here's that image that you liked. And you can see this teacher is doing a little bit of direct instruction. And when that indirect instruction is over, that whiteboard goes away and the students get back to the student-centered model. And there's a teacher there who's completely not disturbed by what this teacher is doing just because of the way we've done it acoustically. So that school was then so um, happy and thrilled with the results. The kids were going home happy, the production level was higher, the quality of the work was so much higher that they told us to do the rest of the school. And here are some of the images from the rest of the school. And they made the architects happy. Yeah, exactly. So here's the before uh, before picture and that same space after. So we got into the lockers and we put in uh, these storage cubbies and a window seat and, you know, comfortable seating. And this used to be the old library, uh, old tired library, which we have completely reformed. And now it's a learning community, again, an old and new. So you can see that, um, that the architecture does mean something, provided the educators follow. So uh, let's see. Oh, so we'll talk about, I thought I was going to talk about the other case study too. Oh, uh, I did talk about oh, both. You I did, did talk, talk about, about two. And now we would yeah. like to know <laughs> how, how can you tell if it's actually working? Yeah. So the, the thing about this is that what one of the things that we like to talk about is that the reason schools look the way they do is because we tend to value the things that we can measure. And what we are saying is we should measure the things that we value. So what do we value? If you ask any parent, if you ask any educator, they will tell you the things that they value, which have to do with soft skills. They'll talk about a problem solving, talk about creativity, talk about uh, critical thinking, right? Uh, negotiation, um, collaboration. These are the things that we value, but how do we know if we are doing these things? So basically what we did is that we designed a number of tools and these are available as apps. And um, I have good news here for the people attending. Those of you who are interested, as I'm talking about to the schools and school districts, it's available at no, no cost and we will uh, help you set it up. Essentially, these apps will help you measure the efficacy of the quality of the spaces and the lesson. What we're saying is there's no point designing a great space if you're not doing within that space the things that you want to do. So for example, what we have is- these Hey, go back a second. You didn't yeah. explain why did you- So yeah, so the marathon, <laughs> yeah, the marathon runner is there because what, basically what we're saying is, look, you don't become a marathon runner overnight, right? So if a marathon runner fell into the school mindset and said, look, I'm going to measure uh, outcomes, there'd be very little to measure. If, if running the marathon is the outcome, it's not going to matter. But if the outcome were, hey, did you get up on time today? Or did you take your run? then it might be, wow, I succeeded. Did you eat properly? Yep, wow, I succeeded. So those are the intermediate measures. In other words, we're measuring the process. We're not measuring the outcome. Because if you do the right process, you'll inevitably get the right outcome. So our point was, why don't we develop tools that measure the process? So we have developed exactly that. So for example, here's a tool that we developed. And, and essentially, this is a lesson that you plug into the system. And then the teacher is given an opportunity to define the skills and competencies that lesson is going to provide, whether it's AP history or whether it's you know uh, science, it doesn't matter. Uh, 
basically the question is, will they be doing independent work? Will they be doing small teams? Will they be working in technologies? It will be student-centered, on and on. And this list can be anything that you want it to be, the school district wanted to be. This is just a starter list that we have created. And then at the end of the class, when the class is over, the teacher basically can go into the, her app and literally in 15 to 20 seconds can say, hmm, let me take a look at the, my class and see how well did I do. Now, if you look at this list, a lot of these things you could not do in a traditional cells and bells model. And so what we are saying is that the reason we are advocating for the changes is precisely because we want teachers and students to be able to do the things that they need to do to be successful. So then the app will tell you precisely how successful you were. And then the teacher can say, well, I'll go back and change this, some of these, because it doesn't make sense. Or she can say, well, next time I'll do better. But this is a self-evaluating app. And then the school gets this stuff at a higher level. So the school can begin to say, wow, looks like 40% of all the instructions happening in our school is direct instruction. Uh, we need to change that. Or we can say certain spaces aren't being used the way they're supposed to be used and on and on. So this kind of instant feedback is what's missing in the design that innovative architects do. We do great architecture, then we go away, and then we leave it entirely in the hands of the school without any real feedback and follow-up. But these apps allow you, the school, to continue to monitor your, uh, the effectiveness of your uh, teaching and learning vis-a-vis -vis the new spaces that we've designed. All right, so the question now is that in the end, um, the question is, what will be the legacy of the COVID crisis uh, on education, of course, and how can we make sure that something good comes out of it to, you know, for the long run? Okay, well, uh, this is a good question because I said, um, we, Ronnie and I, and we have been doing what we know is best, uh, meaning that we've all been through the traditional system, which did not serve us as well, especially as the world is changing. We want to do better by our kids. And so we've been on this journey already. The COVID has just woken people up to the reality that schools uh, need to change. And here's an opportunity that we don't need to go back to business as usual, right? So one diagram that I did, I did a school reopening webinar is to say, first, ideally, if you can repurpose the school, that's wonderful. But beyond school, there are a lot of things that the school can do to facilitate learning that takes advantage of this anytime, anywhere model that Roni had talked about earlier where we don't have to duplicate things outside school that you're doing in school. Most importantly, teaching doesn't have to be synchronous, meaning that teachers and students can communicate um, as on demand, uh, rather than all talking at the same time at this, in the same way. And the crit critical thing is that we don't want to duplicate in the online world what's happening in school. That's absolutely unnecessary. Um, and more important, I think the fact that students are being trapped in front of their computer screens for hours and hours on, on end, we are basically saying the computer screen should be seen as a, as a window into the vast world of learning that incorporates many things beyond computers. So for example, you want to learn to be a gardener. Yeah, you can take some uh, courses or you can, you can uh, watch a YouTube video and then go out and work in the garden, learn to play a guitar, you know, learn to play a piano, learn to become a marathon runner, whatever it is that you need to do, the, the, the technology can be the window to that, but it's not the end result. In other words, the result isn't going to, isn't to get good at computers. The computer is a means to an end, and the end has to be something much bigger. We want to become, grow as human beings. So the problem with this is that change is very, very, very difficult. We've tried this over 20 years, and we know that's because there are four key components. Learning spaces have to change, but that's not enough. We need to then address the curriculum and the schedule side by side with the learning spaces. Governance operations and community are very, very important. We need the help of the superintendent, the principal, the others have to all stand behind. We need to have professional development. Teachers absolutely need to be taught how to work under this new paradigm where they're working in teams as opposed to working individually. So that's why transformation is incredibly difficult because all four pieces of the puzzle have to be there. Just doing the learning spaces is not going to be enough. Uh, so what we do is we have a process called discovery where we bring all the stakeholders of schools together, in this case, of course, in person. But during the COVID crisis, we've been doing this online. And we essentially have these conversations, the one that we are having now. Uh, and basically, this is actually a group of teachers from Barcelona, uh, one of the schools that Roni and I were uh, working with, and they designed their new the environment. When they were given the power to do that, they came up with some amazing ideas, and that space has since been built. Um, and finally, coming to a, a, a measure uh, empowering, I'm talking about a new different tool than the one I just showed you before. This tool is actually one that also available as an app where as we design the spaces or redesign the spaces, we drop these pins, 
talking about the quality of that space and all the learning attributes of that space. So when a teacher is designing a lesson, she thinks about the space as a resource. Just as you think about the computer as a resource, hey, my space is a resource. Why don't I use it the way it's intended to be used? And be when you add the space in as a resource, you can develop very rich lessons that give students those soft skills and competencies that they might not otherwise get. Now, after the school is built, students and teachers have this app on their phones and the student can audit a particular space at any given time. And it's going to become part of the learning process. And that, that audit, they, the students themselves can actually initiate. Exactly, exactly. And then, the, and then what happens is they create the database of what actually was happening at 2 p.m. on Tuesday in this particular area. And that information is recorded. And over time, we begin to see that, hey, this space tended to get very little use. This space was being used, but it was being used for lecture when in fact it should have been a project-based space and so on and so forth. So again, real-time feedback from the actual occupants of the space as opposed to some outsider coming in, uh, inspecting you and auditing you, schools get to do this themselves and get the biggest teaching and learning bang for the buck from these tools. So again, as I said, these tools are available uh, to anybody who's interested. We are happy to share them with you. And I say anybody, I'm talking specifically about educational institutions. Prakash, can you go back uh, yeah. one slide? Yeah. I just want to say it's um, a good time to mention that our design, uh, the way we can see it here, is a good example to emphasize that it's more um, uh, useful. It takes better advantage of the different spaces. There are no, there is no waste, right. and also that it's adjustable. And that app is actually allowing you to know whether you're using uh, the space efficiently, and it's it's allowing you to control change, both changes not just the, again, it's the software and the, ha the hardware. And a good building is a, a building that can adjust uh, to the um, changing needs of the school with time. Right. So we, we don't have much time to talk about this, but I, I just want Roni to just introduce this topic and then- uh, um, Prakash, we actually have uh, 15 to no, but I, I want to Yeah, but I want them to ask questions. I want to get into no, the No, we have, yeah. We have more, I think, than that. Uh, Garciela, can you update us how much time left? And yeah, I just want to say, yeah, we have go till one thirty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What time is it now? It's one. Okay, it's one. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. good. Okay. And so far, yeah. we have only one question, so we're okay. we're good. Thank okay, you. Good. Okay. Let's go ahead, Roni. So everything uh, um, we basically want to say about other learning um, is in this. Um, a booklet of ours uh, that was just recently published and uh, we can send you the it's available on Amazon but we can also send you the link to the electronic version of that next um, basically what we wanted to say is that okay so <laughs> I thought we no, I, had, you I thought we talk, had several pictures talk a little bit just, about the, no we remember we, we decided to um, yeah I just so basically what we're saying is that um we can use this as an opportunity because uh, space is a very uh, outdoor space is a very good solution to um, for the um, uh, distance, the social distance that we need. So we can use outdoor spaces. But what we're what we're saying is, we're not uh, just looking at the um, at the solution. The but also we want it to be um, an opportunity for change. So when we're using the outdoor space, we would like to. Um, recognize the opportunities. Uh, an outdoor space is a very relaxing space. It, uh, it changes the behavior of the students and it has opportunities for research, for um, like gardens and stuff that we cannot do indoors. So we need to adjust the curriculum. We need to give the teachers a chance to uh, have uh, um, some kind of uh, training. And, uh, and then we can keep those changes after COVID time is over. Right. I mean, most people don't realize that you can actually conduct a 21st century education as well or better in outdoors and inside. It's funny, there was even a piece in, uh, in um, New York Times, I think it might have been yesterday or the day before, we talked about classrooms without walls Yeah. outside. The point is, if it's outside and it's not and has no walls, why would you even call it a classroom? I mean, the, the idea is that the mentality is that if you're not in a classroom, somehow learning won't happen. And there's this magic associated with the classroom uh, in which learning happens. And we've just shown you that the classroom actually uh, allows for very few modalities of learning. It is really designed for the industrial age. And so in the fourth industrial revolution, certainly the classroom is not the best place uh, for that and, to happen. 
And again, it can be a very slight change like we've seen with the um, turning classrooms into a learning suite. We just took one wall out. So here again, we need to recognize the opportunity is sometimes just adding some sh shading and, and putting some uh, uh, seatings, uh, uh, places, chairs and tables that creates the opportunities. And the, and the students, of course, the children, they love to spend time outdoors and even in very extreme climates, um, it's healthy, of course, and, and children, if they're dressed properly, then, you know, we say there's no bad weather, there's only bad clothing. So if, if they're dressed properly, they will enjoy being outdoors at least part of their day, and there is no reason why they shouldn't be. Um, Somebody uh, talked about uh, uh, Buffalo. I don't know if you can see my, my screen. Can you see this picture? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we can. can. Yeah. yeah, so that That's is snow in, in, in Saskatchewan, which I think is pretty much more intense weather than Buffalo. So yes, I think that every day of the of the year, regardless of the weather, whether it's snowing, raining, um, if you give students the right kind of clothes, and I've been uh, in international school at Dusseldorf where they go out every single day, two hours a day, regardless of the weather. So as Ronnie was saying, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing. So uh, children have absolutely no problem uh, being outside. And okay. uh, Mr. Uh, Dylan uh, started this talk by talking about the social and emotional needs Right. of children that are kind of being um, pushed aside these yeah. days. So right. definitely outdoor learning is something that encourages that. Yeah. And there's uh, research to show that when children are outdoors, there's less um, uh, violence, they treat each other better. And if they learn to treat uh, a vegetable garden or animals, if possible, then they also learn to treat each, uh, each other and of course the environment uh, in a better way. Right. So this was uh, the big thing here that when the phone was tied with the wire, humans were free. Right now the phone is free uh, and humans are tied to the phone. So I think that talking uh, is a good segue from the outdoor learning piece to say that the idea ultimately is not to get caught up. We talked about the fourth industrial revolution, not to scare people into saying we have to cram more and more stuff in the kids' heads. No, I think even more so now than ever before, we have to get away from that content-based model of education because you know, content is being added to at an exponential rate. I mean, as we speak now, several hundred YouTube videos have already been added and uh, you know, thousands and thousands of web pages have been created in these few minutes that we've talked. So I think that the idea is to have students become much more versatile, agile, problem solvers and kind of use school as an opportunity to do that and dive deep into the areas in which they need um, that deep uh, understanding in order to take their learning to the next level. And children are quite intuitive. They know how to do that. And so I think that we need to uh, take a deep breath, step back and say, this is not about moving faster, but moving smarter. You know, so I think that's kind of where where we are. And I think with that, we will tell you a little bit about our contact information, which is uh, prakashededucationdesign.com, roniateducationdesign.com, our website is educationdesign.com. And uh, we're happy to take, um, take questions. Thank you, pra Prakash and Roni. Um, that was a really great presentation by both of you. Let me just start my video. Okay, thank you. Tony, oh, we can see you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so we have a couple of questions and we have some time now. Uh, so I just want to remind people, keep putting your questions on the Q&A box. We're gonna go through all of them. The first one I have was sent on the chat when you were talking about outdoor learning. Uh, Joe Monticello asked, um, how will these changes impact on the processes used by universities for entrance? Yeah, well, one of the things that's uh, very interesting is that university um, examination, uh, I mean, entrance and criteria have been changing on a very, very rapid clip. Uh, even uh, eight or nine years ago, I think Swarthmore College was rejecting two thirds of kids with perfect SATs. There's two thirds they were rejecting. And now many people, many of them don't even need their SATs anymore. I mean, there's over a thousand schools and colleges that don't even require their SATs. That's one thing. So, so, so keep the university thing in mind. But even as we talk about that, there's a big revolution happening in higher education. And that is that private companies are now getting into the act. Google just announced um, a course that you can take uh, that, in, that you can get a certificate in three months, uh, average of about five or six hours a week, at the conclusion of which you would have sufficient programming skills to get a job at Google starting at $75,000. Uh, and so what's gonna happen is that universities are gonna have a lot of competition 
from the private sector. And I just told you about the Harvard course that we're doing for $99. And so basically universities are jumping on the bandwagon as well. They're offering a lot of these kinds of courses. So what I'm saying is that learning and access to experts, whether it's Stanford or Harvard, is going to be much more democratic, much easier than the old model, which really rewarded higher socioeconomic groups. So essentially, if you look at the map of the United States, kids from so lower socioeconomic groups are already disadvantaged heavily in schools. And I think right now you're going to see a much more democratic system where access to education is going to become much more uh, available. And what we are doing is saying that the 12 years in school should be about preparing students for a different world and not worried so much about whether I will, will I get into college or not. The reality is that if you prepare well for life, you will get into college because you'll have an incredible resume. And also, Prakash, there is no reason why high school students uh, won't be won't get professional training and they can take uh, several courses during high school and have a certificate so once they graduate they can actually start working so a lot of them might be actually skipping uh, universities and colleges yeah in fact that one of the lowest uh, as college attendance uh, is Switzerland Switzerland which also happens to have the highest income for high school students because they use their high school as a certification process where you graduate with skills that can immediately get you into the marketplace. Any other questions? Yes, we have a lot of questions. So the, the next one is regarding the conversion from the belts and hallways. Uh, your conversion models seem to incorporate the egress corridors into the design. How do you maintain the fire egress and much of the elementary flexible furniture in the collaborative rooms had to be removed entirely due to the fact it was soft goods and would be difficult to disinfect? Well, I'll answer both of these questions. The hallway thing, we've actually done a school, Millennium High School in New York City on in Wall Street on the 17th and 30th floor of, um, of a high rise building uh, with the same design that I'm showing you. The, the thing is that from the fire department's point of view, it's far, far easier to egress um, our learning community than it would be at traditional cells and bells because you would have to literally walk into every room to make sure that there's no straggling stragglers there. Uh, and the, the model is no different than an office suite, right? In an office suite, you don't have corridors running through the entire suite and it's it divided into two, uh, a hallway that's separate space. So when you look at the suite, you have distances to the fire exits and we comply with all of that. Fire departments have told us in some of the most tough environments, like for example, Germany, they're very, very strict about fire codes that our designs are far more safe uh, in terms of egress and kids can get out much faster uh, in these buildings. So that's- And the uh, teacher can make sure that nobody's forgotten because she exactly. can see, she has yeah. a visual. Yeah, and, the, and as far as the furniture is concerned, this is a new thing about the disinfecting thing. And I, I would say that it's a relatively uh, short-term uh, issue that we have to deal with. However, the lot of the furniture that uh, we're talking about does not have to have uh, can have seats that are comfortable, but also easy to clean. Surfaces that can be wiped clean very, very fast and very easily. And the vast majority of the stuff we use are surfaces that can actually be easily clean. I do agree that fabrics that absorb moisture and other contaminants are not necessarily the best things to uh, incorporate. Someone has a question regarding the colors of the renovated spaces. They want to know what was involved in the choices of colors. Ronnie, and the choices of colors. I yeah. think it's um it's individual to every project. Um, you know, it depends on on the preparation of the client, on the amount of light. Sometimes we distinguish uh, certain learning communities with a certain palette of colors. Um, so it's a matter of choice, basically. A question um, that we usually get, which is related to that, is uh, when the colors are very strong. How is that affecting the uh, children's ability to focus? And the question is, again, it's a question of choice, but usually we, we are choosing the more relaxing colors. And there's always a choice within um, the learning communities between spaces. Uh, exactly like we have the commons area and we have the quiet rooms and the small uh, spaces and the cave spaces. So with the colors as well, usually we have a dominant color, but there are areas where the colors are um, a lot more gentle and it's not um, a visual uh, harassment to the eye. Yeah, I mean, the idea is not to create something so dramatic that you get great pictures as an architect, 
but that you have to then live with as, a, as an occupant of that space. So it's good to have um, a, a bright colors as highlights, but like Roni said, daylighting, um, the idea is to create lightness and, and feeling of um, calmness. And you saw the picture that Roni had shared of that uh, uh, one of the schools, which is very Zen. You know, the colors are contributed by the elements in the room and not necessarily coloring all the rooms uh, very bright. And when you're talking about colors, I want to definitely address very early childhood. For some strange reason, we put a lot of very super bright colors. It's not good for them. Young children need pastels and not bright reds and yellows and blues, which we unfortunately confuse that they need it. Babies might need that, but not younger children. For younger children, they need pastels just like everybody else. Next question talks about, again, the change from cells and bells to a more flexible, uh, flexible physical space. Uh, they say that it would have to be done along with changes in the curriculum, which yes. may be much harder to achieve to meet various federal and state education standards. Also, teachers would need to be retrained to get away from the lecture format and to collaborate with other teachers. Is this true? No, I think the curriculum is not true at all because what we are talking about here is the how, is not the what. I mean, you can teach anything in these spaces. And what we are saying is what is the collateral benefits, educational benefits that I can also get. So if I'm teaching a specific lesson from a textbook, that's great if that's what I have to do. But I also want to incorporate in that lesson independent work, research, team collaboration, project-based learning. I can incorporate all of these things and still address that particular curriculum. So it's not what I learn, but how I learn. So that's one thing. And the second is that the curriculums actually have a lot of, uh, no matter what curriculum you look like, they do have a lot of flexibility in them. They're not delivered in the same way in different parts of the, parts of the same school district even. So flexibility is there. The teacher training, we completely agree. Absolutely critical. You cannot make something like this work without uh, profession development. And that's why we suggest the, the Pathfinder model where we begin with a small pilot project, train the teachers, and those teachers are usually volunteers who are based, we call them uh, uh, innovation fellows. And so we give them the expertise in the training and then they become mentors as this thing scales up. And so they become internal mentors for the other teachers in the school. And this is a far better thing than introducing a lot of external um, uh, trainee, trainers into the school. And since we've been doing this dozens of times all over the world, we know this model actually works. It works, it works even better because instead of us explaining and persuading and uh, maybe even use the word inspire, they can actually see it in uh, action. And when people see it uh, uh, as a success, they all wanna join in. Mm -hmm. I just wanna point out Prakash about uh, what you said uh, earlier when you started answering this question is that we put a lot of emphasis, emphasis on knowledge the curriculum is a certain uh, knowledge that we would like our student to uh, get at a certain time, but the em emphasis should be also on, on getting the skills because we don't know what knowledge our children will need to succeed in the future world, but we would like them to uh, have uh, all these abilities and all these skills that you mentioned earlier, and that's why we put the focus on that. Thank you. Next question uh, says, as a result of COVID and thinking futuristically, how do you envision brick and mortar schools? Will, be, will they be smaller given maybe not 100% attend at the same time and or being outside or in the community? Well, I'll give you one specific example that answers that. Uh, and that happened even before COVID where we were asked to uh, design a high school in a, in a, in a town in uh, Virginia. And we decided together with the community that perhaps a better idea was to create a series of small hubs uh, specializing in different uh, 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 subject areas, whether it's forensics or robotics or medical science in partner with industry, almost like a Starbucks kind of thing. And that all the uh, common elements like swimming pools and football teams and all that, the existing high schools could provide. So if a third of the kids are always out in the, at these different hubs, the high school kids, I mean, then you don't need to duplicate an extra comprehensive high school. So that's one, one uh, alternative. And the other alternative is, yes, absolutely agree that a society retools, like when women started going to work, for example, they needed to create a whole system of uh, childcare, right? That was originally being done uh, by women at home. So in the same way as society retools, uh, you know, in other countries, this is not a, as much of an issue because they have multiple opportunities for 
uh, uh, children uh, to be taken care of. Uh, whereas here, we schools become our de facto daycare centers, you know, and we don't want that to be the case. So I think that the conversation should be had. And uh, certainly we are seeing many cases where the schools that we are ourselves designing don't look or feel uh, like traditional schools. They are smaller in many cases because we're using community resources. Um, and uh, they're also community centers. So they're not just for children. Um, they're for everybody in the, in the, in the community. They're learning centers for everybody. I just want to note that the Hobbs option you just mentioned is also from environmental standpoint, um, uh, kind of uh, has an advantage because we can also take advantage of uh, uh, existing facilities like public buildings and we can use those uh, outside school uh, territory and not necessarily uh, keep building new buildings for schools. Okay, next, next question uh, says, how are these changes in the learning paradigm, paradigm impacted by COVID in terms of ventilation, distances, et cetera? Well, the ventilation uh, is a good question because the reality is that uh, most, uh, many, many schools, we don't have uh, good ventilation. Forget about COVID, it, it wasn't healthy. We don't have the required number of air changes, particularly in the older buildings, you know? So I think that this is a great time to do that. And um, regardless of COVID, there could be another pandemic that comes in the future. So we firmly believe that ventilation system should be designed so that they filter out uh, the, you know, there's micro filtering of, of viruses um, and things like that. So that they're, they're always breathing, children are always breathing healthy air. You know, it doesn't have to be this virus, it could be any other virus. So that's one thing that I think is definitely going to be a, an offshoot of this, that there's going to be some significant, and I think uh, certainly one of the presidential candidates has been talking about retrofitting existing buildings for them to be more sustainable. And as part of that could also be the ventilation thing. As far as the distancing is concerned, Roni brought up the idea of the outdoor learning. So I think many schools don't realize that there's a significant uh, asset right there. I mean, in New York City in 1907, and it's in our book, uh, they did uh, outdoor learning because of the TB pandemic. And essentially there was not a single case of, of TB in the schools as a result of that. So we think we can definitely think about the outdoors as a short-term solution to a lot of the social distancing issues. And hopefully it's a short-term thing because social distancing and education don't really go hand in hand. You know, I think that children should, they, it's going to be very difficult to tell young children that you can't get close enough to another kid or touch them, you know. So hopefully this is a short-term short -term problem. Okay, next question is also regarding HVAC, but I think you already responded to, to the same concern. He was just uh, talking about HVAC concerns ch change designs. Um, next one is how the increased concern of security in schools addressed is addressed in the open concept plan. Well, first of all, we want to make sure that this is not an open concept in the traditional sense, because it, in the 1970s, we had something called open school, open plan, which is not that. It's a variety of closed and open spaces. There is transparency, of course. But the key is that all the research that's coming from the security uh, industry shows that the designs that we are showing you are far, far more secure from a security standpoint. You have to, if you're talking about uh, the potential threat from, from an outside gunman or something like that. For one thing, students can get out of the building much faster and scatter. Uh, and the second thing is that a gunman is going to be more visible. And the third is it's actually more easy to secure an entire zone than is to secure each and every single classroom. Because if you're in a zone, you can put a, a bulletproof uh, a door and secure that entire zone. And within each zone, in some cases where the security has been a real concern, we've created one of the rooms in our learning community. And in Israel, it's a great example of this. It's an actually literally like a fortress. So you can retreat into that. So if there's an attack, everybody gets into that one zone and that room is literally you know, bomb proof. You know? So there are so many different ways to secure the buildings uh, in our model that is far, far superior to a, to a classroom, which you can just kick in and the students are sitting like the same ducks in there. So uh, there's zero evidence that the existing designs are any safer than what we are, what we are proposing. Uh, we have a building code question. Given the concepts being discussed, it seems that current school building codes would be in conflict or in need of change to accommodate these ideas. Has that been an issue for you in any of the projects you have worked on? How willing 
how the regulators have been willing to adapt to these changes? Well, as I said, we are not compromising on safety. We are not compromising on security and we're not compromising on fire safety. We're not compromising on any of the building codes in that regard. So I don't know what other building codes we're talking about here. There are some jurisdictions which specify the, uh, the classroom sizes and the number of doors needed and all that. And those are usually requirements that are at a school district level. And we've had school districts have been willing to get away from that because they, many of them don't make any sense. But we don't compromise on any safety uh, issues whatsoever. And that's the reason we've never had, as far as I know, we've been not been a single school design of ours that's been rejected because they don't meet uh, building code or security code. Now, there are situations where if you do a learning community, we have to uh, show an area that that is a sort of potential means of egress. So you're not allowed to put furniture and things in those kinds of spaces. Uh, we had that issue in Spain, for example. So yeah, that's the kind of thing that we would, of course, do as part of the operations and training of the teachers. We have one, we have one last question before uh, closing remarks. Do you recommend any particular training for teachers for outdoor learning? Yeah, less us, more them. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Rodney and I'd like to talk about that, which is basically saying that outdoor is a great example for teachers to step back, give very high level assignments, uh, which require open-ended questions that require students to do most of the work and take advantage. You know, Roni, you have anything better? Yeah. I think it might be a good opportunity for you to uh, shortly discuss the change in the role of the teacher. I mean, yeah. to understand that it has changed. Yeah, right, obviously, because as I said, the teacher used to be the font of all knowledge and information. Right now, they are a guide. So the teacher doesn't need to take on the kind of responsibility that they used to take on because right now they are tapping into students' natural potential, natural ability to learn, especially if they're engaged. And then learning, learning comes as a, a good byproduct of that. So yeah, I think that outdoor learning is no different. I think the key thing Roni had mentioned earlier was that the key with the outdoors is that you're leaving the classroom behind, right? So, yeah. so the, the, once you leave the classroom behind, you are already in winning territory because now you are in an environment that's far better for learning than you could be trapped in a box. Thank you so much, Ronnie and Prakash, for this uh, great lecture and for answering all the questions. I'm going to pass it out on to Tony for closing remarks. Thank you, Graciela. Uh, before we close out the webinar and the webinar series, uh, I'd just like to take a moment to thank everyone who made this uh, the series possible. Uh, first, a very special thank you to today's speakers, uh, Prakash Nair and Ronnie Zimber Dattori, for an outstanding interactive and very informative uh, presentation. I know that we'll all benefit from your insights and on how we can begin to transform, transform school design during these uh, very trying times. Uh, I'd also like to once again, thank our presenters from the first two webinars, Janine Katab, Tracy Graham and Kevin Walsh, as well as Christine Coghlan from the New York City Education Department. Uh, thank you to Dr. Robert Dillon, our NASA BOCES superintendent for his participation. Uh, as well as the NASA BOCES board and our communications office for all their support. And uh, thanks to Nicole O'Donnell, who's, who did a great job for us as our sign interpreter and for all three webinars. And also thanks to the Thought Exchange team for all their help. Uh, special thank you to our co-host, uh, AIA Long Island and to Graciela Carrillo, as well as the entire AIA Long Island team for all of their efforts and their hard work in helping to develop the webinar series uh, thanks also to AA Northern Virginia for their participation. Uh, they were in, involved in, in the uh, first webinar. Um, finally, I'd like to especially thank all of you in our audience for joining us today and to all who attended the entire three-part webinar series. You play such an important role in this conversation and we greatly appreciate your input and your feedback. Uh, as, as I've stated many times, uh, throughout this series, each of you in your roles represent the primary stakeholders in education. So your voice is essential in moving this discussion forward. Uh, so before we end today's session, I just would like to share my screen for a moment. Uh, okay, so. Okay, can you, can you see that? Hopefully you yes, can we that. can see that, Tony, and uh, I did put in the chat the links that you provide there. Okay, so I just wanted to provi provide everyone with a, a graphic recap of the three-part webinar series. 
Uh, all three of these webinar presentations are listed here on this page. You can view the webinars on our homepage at, NASA, at the NASA BOCES website at www.nasabocies.org. Uh, as, as Graciela mentioned earlier, um, I believe they're also, this is also available on the AIA Long Island uh, website, which is uh, aialongisland.com. Uh, once again, our sincere thanks to all of our presenters who made this webinar series so successful. So where do we go from here? What are our next steps? Well, we, we plan to continue these webinars in the months ahead, focusing on other school planning and design related topics relevant to educational facilities. So please stay tuned for that. And we'll send out program announcements to all of you as we develop future webinar topics. Uh, we'd also like to consider holding uh, workshops with any school districts who might be interested in exploring some of the ideas uh, discussed in these presentations. So if you're interested or have any questions, suggestions, uh, ideas for potential future topics, you can contact me directly at uh, the web. The, uh, my email address is, is on this, this page. It's afierospd at nasboces.org. Again, it's afiero and SPD for school planning and design at nasboces.org. So we would we very much appreciate, would very much appreciate hearing from you uh, if you have any, any feedback or, or would like to participate further. Let me stop sharing this for a second. Okay, so that concludes the webinar series. We hope that you found the three sessions helpful and informative. Thanks to all of you, be well. Hope to see you again soon. So take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, you. Tony, uh, Ronnie and Prakash and Nicole Thanks. and Dr. Dillon. Also, you're gonna get a follow-up email from the chapter with all the links that we discussed today in the webinar for books and applications and uh, all the resources that uh, Ronnie and Prakash can uh, share with all of you. So bye -bye. have a great day. Thanks to all of you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Great job. Great job. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye.